This is Selma Schimmel, and you are looking live at the great city of Chicago, which is once again playing host to the American Society of Clinical Oncology, ASCO. This is ASCO's 49th annual meeting, and this year's theme could not be more appropriate, Building Bridges to Conquer Cancer. More than 30,000 of the world's foremost cancer specialists are here, and so is the group room, making our 15th appearance at ASCO and one of our very best. Joining me now is Dr. Eduardo Barrera, Department Chair in the Department of Palliative Care and Rehabilitation Medicine in the Division of Cancer Medicine at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. Hello, Dr. Barrera. Hi. How do we help medical oncologists not to feel that anyone is diminishing their capability, but it's its own specialty? Yes. That's wonderful. When, when Verdi was asked what was opera all about, he said there's three things to opera. The voice, the voice, and the voice. And then he went. He was not very good for journalists. But then when they ask you what palliative care is, it's about three things. Assessment, assessment, and assessment. It's not so much about prescribing one thing or another. But when somebody says, I'm hurting, doctor, what is hurting? Is it the back hurting or is it the back and the threat to your life and the sadness? And what is hurting is complex. And therefore what palliative care specialists are trained to do is to do a very thorough assessment of all the problems that are bringing this expression of suffering. And patients sometimes themselves are not so completely sure about what is causing this problem that is called pain. So it's quite appropriate that the oncologist, as part of the assessment, prescribes a medicine, and if the problem is overwhelmingly just that knee that's hurting, the patient will come next week and say, hey doc, I'm doing fine, and there's no more problem. But if the patient comes next week with a good dose of a painkiller and says, doc, my knee's still hurting a lot, and on top of that, I'm not going to the bathroom, I'm having low energy, I'm having low appetite, that's a reason why these patients should now be receiving kind of a step up in care. And the way we have it is that same day they can see me. So they see their oncologist in the morning, they see me later in that morning, they don't have to take another trip, and I will do that very kind of thorough assessment and we will work together. I'm speechless only because it's such a profound task and I don't know as the field of palliative medicine grows, exactly how those goals will be accomplished. But it's, it has to happen. Mm -hmm. And the name, as you say, and there have been think tanks coming together analyzing, do we have to change the name? Is there a better name? Is it the name palliative care that is in itself stigmatized? You mentioned an important issue about the concerns, the fears. And basically, we looked at that quite a bit because we measured that in a study of anonymous surveys of 100 random medical oncologists and 100 mid-level providers. And they said exactly what you just said. They were not concerned about sending a patient at any time of the disease to a center named supportive care, but they had serious fears about sending a patient to a center named palliative care because they were afraid that the family were going to Google palliative and find that it was associated with hospice or dying and they had to have a conversation uh, and so they were more reluctant to send a patient. So we could engage in a two or three year process of discussion or education or we could just change the name at the front and that's what we did. We changed the name of the outpatient service to supportive care and that increased 41 percent the referrals just very rapidly after because they were feeling more confident. Mm -hmm. And it also distressed, it decreased the distress on the patients and families too by going to a place called supportive care operated by palliative medicine specialists because we are all specialists in palliative medicine and there was no difference in the services that we gave, there was a difference in the name. And there's something to be said about names that can be sometimes a little bit of a barrier for, for, uh, for referral uh, early enough. So we find that uh, the name might be useful until people get familiar with what palliative care really is. Now, one of the reflection points 
we had to say is what do we tell our colleagues and what do we tell our patients and families? And then we started to read about goals of care. And goals of care is a complex area. It was hard to read, it was hard to understand. So we kind of created our own model because in Texas, if you don't have a car, you're in trouble. So we defined it as goals of car. And we said, what is palliative care to you? When you buy a car, you really have goals for your car. You want to go for holidays, you want to go to work, you want to enjoy your car and that's why you buy a car. But you know that sometimes you park it outside the shopping mall and when you come out, the car has left without you. Other times you get, you know, run over by an 18-wheeler because the driver is asleep. So what do you do? You buy insurance, you lock your car, you wear a seat belt. That doesn't mean you're depressive or a loser. It means you know that even while your goals are very good for your car, some things might not go your way. So when you got a cancer, you need to do the same thing as you do for your car. That is, you basically have goals of prolonging your life, getting cured, getting clinical trials, getting the best cancer care you can, but you will take precautions. You will talk to the family, you will say, what happens if I cannot drive to the hospital? What happens if you cannot work anymore? What happens if I need help to get a glass of water? What do I need to say to my family? So it's totally compatible to keep your goals or getting your, ca your cancer treated, controlled and perhaps cured with at the same time taking the same precautions you take when you buy a car. So with that model of the goals of car, we were able to talk a little bit about how it's completely uh, integrated that you get your cancer treatment and you get your supportive and palliative care at the same time, not in a sequential manner, but in an integrated manner. I have seen progress, and there has been considerable progress in the understanding that, that there's no reason for a medical oncologist to fear working close by a, a, a palliative care team. And as you heard wonderfully earlier today, Dr. Patrick Hu, a hardcore melanoma specialist says, we were very close with this team. Our phase one team sends us almost all their patients and a lot of the patients from almost every tumor area come to us on a regular basis. So I think there's been great progress. Perhaps the people who need education are really the medical school deans, the center cancer directors, the people who are at a higher leading role that belong to my generation where they were never trained on this and the younger generation has adopted this very well, but the older generation is having a little bit more difficulty making it operational. And this justification is there clinically, and the good news, and that's why I'm so optimistic, is the justification is clearly there financially. I'm very grateful that you took time out to spend with us today in the group room. Dr. Eduardo Barrera, Department Chair, Department of Palliative Care and Rehabilitation Medicine in the Division of Cancer Medicine at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thanks for having me here.